So my name is Ruth Brown and I use the pronouns she, her and I'm the president of the Australian BPD Foundation and I'd really like to welcome everyone to this webinar, particularly Lois, on um, the topic of re recovery as a destination and an intervention for personality disorder. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on, on which we are meeting today both from within Australia and overseas, and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. I am joining you from the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in Victoria, and you might like to indicate in the chat function where you're joining the webinar from. So just a little bit about the Foundation. We're a group of volunteers passionate in developing an open dialogue between consumers, carers, clinicians and researchers to encourage a positive culture around the mental health condition currently known as borderline personality disorder or BPD and that's with or without experiences of complex trauma. We are registered as a charity by the ACNC and all donations are tax deductible. So this webinar, which Lois has kindly agreed to do for us, is part of our events for BPD Awareness Week, which is the first week in October each year in Australia. And this year we had the theme of living life well, recovery and BPD. And we had a number of events that took place around Australia. And even though this isn't actually BPD Awareness Week, we believe it's really important to keep that awareness and understanding going throughout the year and not just to focus it all on one week. I'd also just like to acknowledge the significant challenge experienced by people living with or supporting a person living with BPD. However, I'd like to just highlight that this is not a therapy space and we'll be unable to respond to any personal concerns you may have via this platform. If you're seeking some specific information or resources, a volunteer, Stella, will seek to assist you. Once again, she's not a therapist. And please contact her via um, the admin email, which I'll put in the chat in a minute. If you feel distressed during the webinar, please engage in your strategies for responding to distress. Just some housekeeping. It's being recorded and the link and the slides will be sent out as soon as possible. After the webinar, uh, have your please have your mics off and your cameras on and off, however you feel comfortable. I ask you to please be respectful of the diverse experiences and ways of understanding and communicating experiences that people may have. Once Lois has finished, she's kindly agreed to be answering some questions. So please use the chat function and I'll then collate and facilitate the discussion. It's expected that the duration of today will be about one and a half hours. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce Lois Choi Kane from Harvard University and the Gunderson Personality Disorders Institute. I had the really great pleasure of meeting Lois when she was visited Melbourne earlier this year. And her and John Gunderson's work into identifying the, the core principles of what works for people living with BPD and, and looking beyond the, the specialist therapies like DBT and MBT, I believe is making treatment and support much more accessible for everyone. Her warmth, her passion and dedication to ensuring that clinicians have the skill set and the willingness to work with people living with BPD is phenomenal. I doubt she ever sleeps. And she's presenting to us at 7 p.m. her time. So I do really appreciate you joining us from Boston today. Thanks, Lois. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Rita. And thank you all for being here. I'm looking forward to having this 90-minute um, time with you all. And I hope what I have to present will be helpful to understanding something about the path you're on, whatever role you occupy with people who have BPD and other PDs. I um, want to just have some like an instruction label on my lectures. I'm glad Rita is 
recording this for review or for people who miss this um, and have to watch it at their own um, time, on their own time, because I, I have a habit of packing it in, <laughs> having a lot of information and slides. And some people experience it, I've been told, as like a fire hydrant, trying to drink out of a fire hydrant. So I'm I'm not desiring that that's an experience because I want you to just listen in and focus on what you find useful at first pass. And you can always return to this video later to um, absorb different facts um, and different elements of the lecture over time. I think the best lessons have many things to discover over time about the wisdom in those lessons based on what we're confronted with at any one time. And that's a lesson I learned from John Gunderson, whose statements um, oftentimes um, continue to reveal their wisdom to me, even though he's long gone. So I am going to share my screen and we're going to get started. And if I do run low on time, I'm going to just cut some of the slides out so that we can definitely preserve the time to talk at the end. So when Rita approached me about doing this talk, I thought that this topic of this year's um, BPD Awareness um, Week events was a wonderful one. Living life well when you have BPD and really for that matter, any disorder is just a human goal. We all have different um, problems that we face in our lives. Some of them have diagnostic labels that luckily lead to um, interventions that might be helpful and supportive of our trajectory along our life's course. Um, but in a way, this is really humanizing the um, work that people with BPD and other P PDs have to do, which is try to aim for functional recovery, regardless of where the process of remission from symptoms is. Because actually being in the world and attempting to function with all the ups and downs that involves is not just a goal, but it in and of itself provides sources of personality stability. That is um, self-direction, a sense of purpose, self-esteem, self-clarity, as well as a stable and predictable way of connecting with others in this world. So what I'm going to do is try to tell a story about what I think is important in achieving functional recovery for people with BPD and other PDs. And I'm going to use a lot of facts to tell that story. But again, the facts are only um, kind of parts of the narrative. They really are not um, critical in and on themselves. So try to kick back and um, follow along. These are my conflicts that I do receive royalties for the sale of GPM books. But, you know, really, I write these books to encourage clinicians to stop becoming so preoccupied with all the techniques that these evidence-based treatments um, outline and instead try to build a real relationship in the treatment. Um, the truth is that the manualization of psychotherapies allows clinicians to feel security, stability, and self-direction in managing the ups and downs of being in a relationship with someone who has borderline personality disorder and its related interpersonal hypersensitivity. But really, the relationship is only useful insofar as it's going to translate into improving the real lives of the people in treatment. 
because we all know on some level that we can have a good relationship with a clinical professional, even if the treatment is not going very well. But hopefully we can um, help foster good enough real relationships in therapeutic settings for people who have BPD and other PDs so that they can improve their lives. And then those lives become the sustaining generator of ongoing personality development. So the working alliance we develop in our clinical work as mental health professionals is invested in so that you can do the work of treatment. Having an alliance is not the end all be all, it's a vehicle to help patients achieve goals that help them recover and have a meaningful life and role in society, whatever that may mean for each individual. And we sometimes um, confuse the fact that we aim to reduce symptoms um, as a goal of treatment with the end of treatment. So a lot of clinicians get really preoccupied with reducing the symptoms. And then when they're reduced, it feels like they've done their job. But actually the symptom reduction is only a means to help people with BPD and other personality disorders be able to get into the ball game of functioning in the real world. And this is where we don't do enough to help patients have the support they need once their symptoms are reduced enough that they can take on these meaningful challenges and sustain the gains that they've made in their treatment. Because if we think about treatments in terms of the way station of symptom reduction so that we can promote functioning, then it's more obvious to us treatments when treatments are not that effective in the bigger picture. Things like over-sedation by medication, you can achieve symptom reduction, but actually it's at the expense of functioning in the real world. You can reduce contact with stressful environments um, through avoidance, but that also is at the expense of learning how to function in the real world. So, this is kind of the overall outline of what I aim to talk about today. Starting with the good news that we've learned through the scientific study of BPD, which we know the most about and have established the most effective treatments for, and therefore, in a way, it's the most important personality disorder in our field because it so obviously needs to be diagnosed and treated effectively. The other PDs are no less important in a way, but we just don't have as much clarity about them. BPD has long been stigmatized as a entity that um, doesn't change. It's kind of pervasive, uh, fixed, chronic, unchangeable that has even been written in the DSM, but actually it's from longitudinal prospective studies, meaning when we follow people with BPD over long periods of time without giving them a set treatment, we learn a lot about the natural course of the disorder. And the good news is contrary to popular belief back in the day, BPD is a condition that does result in symptomatic remission over long periods of time in the majority of people with the disorder. Now, remember that I said symptomatic remission has to be considered in the context of functional recovery. So while this is good news that about four-fifths of all people with BPD um, will um, remit symptomatically from meeting the criteria of the disorder. That's not the end of the story because this happens over 10 years time and it means different things for different people. 
But on the whole, on average, what these naturalistic longitudinal studies have shown is even though the symptoms are meaningfully reduced, it does not translate or mean that people with BPD actually function better as a result of their symptomatic remission. Now, John Gunderson spent um, many years, probably about almost 20 years, studying BPD in a, a large longitudinal study called CLIPS, the Collaborative Longitudinal Study of Personality. That was a multi-site study in the U.S. with a lot of well-known researchers as collaborators across the Northeast of America. And while they found this high rate of symptomatic remission, they also found that functioning over time didn't change. This was a major finding back in 2011. And one of the most important findings in John's four decades of doing this work. Because it points to something that we have to keep in mind in treatment um, and continue to learn lessons from, which I think we are doing still, even though now it's over a decade later. Mary Zanarini here at McLean ran a second study that was a prospective longitudinal study called MSAD, the McLean Study of Adult Development. And she also looked at this question of how many people remit versus how many people recover when they have BPD. Now she did this at McLean Hospital when everyone who started at baseline had been in the hospital at McLean. And this was way before DBT or MBT or any of those evidence-based treatments were widely disseminated, even at a place of expertise like McLean. Now, what she found was actually a lot of people achieve remission um, whether you have borderline personality disorder or another personality disorder. Her comparison group was other personality disorders who are also um, in people who are also hospitalized at the start of the study. And a, almost 100% of all the people who are enrolled in the study before DBT, MBT, TFP, or any of those treatments were well disseminated, achieved two years of a remission. So you see that that's equal between the two groups. But the rate of recurrence for BPD, which was much higher than for the other personality disorders, it was about approaching, you know, 37-ish percent. It's like almost 40% there. Whereas recurrence after remission for people with other personality disorders was really fairly uncommon. Now, eight-year periods of remission was actually achieved by a lot of people with BPD at baseline, but even more people with other personality disorders, which is an indicator of some good news there. But the recurrence of um, BPD or other PDs after this length of remission was quite low. So that side of this story is really pretty good news. And it actually taught us that the prognosis for BPD is in some ways better than the prognosis of what's often misdiagnosed in its presence, which is bipolar disorder, where the rate of recurrence or another episode is much higher. Now, when we go though to recovery, we see slightly different results, but I think they're very meaningful. First of all, you see here that fewer people with BPD than other personality disorders will achieve a two-year recovery. That means not only having um, uh, symptoms lower than the required five to meet the diagnosis, but also having a, a job or going to school, something that is a uh, substantial role and set of responsibilities outside of one's home and having a relationship aside from your nuclear family. 
So when it comes to those criteria, you see that actually still a majority of those with BPD who have been hospitalized at McLean will achieve a two-year period of recovery. That's pretty good. And even more people with other personality disorders will find the same outcome. But the loss of that recovery is also pretty common because the stability of sustaining that level of functioning is more shaky for people who have BPD, even when they've remitted. And if you look at the eight year rate of um, span of recovery, so people who, with BPD who achieve eight years total in a row of sustained um, meaningful work related or school related activity outside the home and a, a relationship outside your nuclear family, that is um, a minority of people, but still a, a good number. It's about 40%, but the loss of that is 20%, okay? So you see the gap with other personality disorders where the functional impairment is not so great. Now keep that in mind. I know this is a lot of facts, but just keep that in mind that recovery is possible for those with BPD, but it's harder and it's less stable. Now in her work, she even did a more stringent analysis of factors that predict excellent recovery. And they include higher IQ, good childhood work history, adult vocational record, low le levels of neur neuroticism, that is like negativity in your emotional kind of um, set point and higher levels of agreeableness. Now you can see why these factors are predictive of recovery, but this work and vocational record um, uh, issue is one that I want to continue to talk about throughout the this next 60 minutes. Because I think that people um, regard this um, in a cursory way, not knowing what to do with it. But what this means is that the person has had an experience of learning how to navigate an environment and adapt to it. And that is hard to do for all of us, harder when you have BPD. So it shows a number of factors coalescing well for that person that enables them to achieve a good work history, either in childhood or adulthood. So I think that's kind of an indicator of a lot of things rather than an endowment, like higher IQ, lower neuroticism, or high agreeableness. Now, Psychosocial impairment in BPD, we, we talked about, is relatively stable over time. And this is a significant level of functional impairment, like I showed you in that first graph from Cliffs. The level of functioning is lower than that of those with other personality disorders and those with major depression. Changes in BPD symptoms affect functional levels. So I think we've also talked about that is that if you reduce some of the symptoms, then the, it will be easier to function in a st stable way. And of course, when you have BPD, it's likely because of the symptoms that you'll have poor interpersonal functioning. Interpersonal instability is one of the hallmarks of the disorder. And this is the interesting part, which I'll talk in more detail about throughout the lecture, is that there's a lot of focus on trauma and trauma is um, psychologically toxic for people and lots of different psychiatric disorders um, develop out of trauma. But there's a misunderstanding that trauma equals BPD. Yes, trauma is very prevalent for people who have BPD, and BPD is an understandable outcome of having had significant trauma. But in fact, in the scientific literature, more negative life events and stressors, while these happen in BPD, they may not have the driving force to why people have BPD that we think it does. 
And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But overall, the psychosocial functioning status of those with BPD is impaired, not just compared to those people without BPD, but even compared to other psychiatric patients who have other personality disorders, mood disorders, or even schizoaffective disorder. So we used to just focus on trying to reduce symptoms because we know that remission from BPD predicts improvement in psychosocial functioning for people in the longitudinal studies. And of course, if you decrease your emotional instability and your interpersonal reactivity, you will improve your relationships with family and friends, right? So these things also make sense. Now, this is this um, kind of complex issue about life stressors and BPD. Those with BPD have poor levels of psychosocial functioning regardless of stressful life events. And I'll tell you more about that. Those without BPD are distressed due to stressful life events, but actually those with, with BPD have poor levels of psychosocial functioning regardless of whether or not there's stressors. And I know that's gonna be difficult to understand, but I'll unpack that as we get to it. Now, clearly um, functional impairment will evolve or remit over time. So there are many types of trajectories for people who have personality disorders in general. Some people will have no personality disorder throughout their life. And in this study, this was CLIPS actually, and this was um, a, an analysis led by Andy Skodal. So on the far right, you see people who have no personality disorder throughout the 10 years time. Then we have some people who have a personality disorder in the past, but they achieve remission. They're almost as stable as those with no PD throughout. And then we have people who develop the PD later in life, okay? So they didn't have it in their childhood and their early adulthood may lend towards that higher um, level of good childhood work functioning and adult vocational record. And then the least stable are those who have persistent PD symptoms throughout their entire life from childhood, all through those developmental stages. Unsurprisingly, the highest level of impairment and lowest level of functioning exists for those who spend the, the most time or the highest proportion of their life symptomatic with a personality disorder. And these symptoms interfere with taking advantage of life opportunities that can build a sense of self and stable connection to others. So whether or not people can achieve remission makes a difference in their level of functioning, no doubt. But when we look at this in the scope of comparing BPD to other personality disorders, we see that the effect of symptom change on functioning over time is actually very complicated. People who have schizotypal personality disorder, avoidant personality disorder, or, or obsessive compulsive personality disorder, they may reduce their symptoms, but it has a smaller effect on increasing their functioning than reducing BPD symptoms in people with BPD, okay? So if someone has BPD, like I said, this is the most important personality disorder for us mental health professionals in a way, because you can get the most change to occur by reducing those symptoms with effective treatment that fosters good functioning, right? But this is where it gets really complicated. Even though that's true, that you can radically improve functioning by reducing BPD symptoms, that group still has worse functioning um, globally, socially, and in terms of employment than people with other personality disorders, namely avoidant and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. disorder. 
And regardless of the flavor of personality disorder, this study shows that quality of life is impaired for people with any personality disorder. It's more important having a personality disorder is a more important predictor of quality of life than any so-called axis one disorder like mood, anxiety, behavioral trauma related disorder, any sociodemographic factor or any somatic health condition. Also um, avoidant schizotypal uh, Paranoid, schizoid, and BPD have the strongest and broadest decrease in quality of life. Notice these are all the personality disorders in which people will be the most isolated. So loneliness kills. We know that through research. But I think this is a problem of loneliness and social isolation. Um, actually, in histrionic personality, obsessive comp compulsive, passive aggressive and sadistic, those don't exist as real categories anymore. There is no decrease in quality of life. So you can have a personality disorder without a decrease in quality of life, depending on the personality disorder. And when you have a personality disorder, it increases the likelihood of um, other having other symptoms of other personality disorders and that in combination decreases quality of life. So treating personality disorders broadly, BPD most of all, but also the other personality disorders will have significant effects on improving functioning. But still, I say that with a context that individuals with BPD still show more impairment in vocational outcome than other PDs, and lower labor market attachment than nearly any other disorder, except for schizophrenia, delusional disorder, and some substance use disorders. So it's very functionally disabling. Now I'm gonna rewind to why this is from my point of view. Because this trouble begins early with falling off a developmental pathway due to the endowments that put people at risk for developing BPD. So these are this starts oftentimes in childhood. Those are the persistent PD people, not the late adult on, onset PD people. They are born with temperaments and then encounter adversities with low levels of support that begin to kindle the flame of developing a personality disorder. And then that, that, that process of how those symptoms interfere with growing up then starts to increase the marginalization of people with BPD specifically, but all PDs globally. And it starts to marginalize people from life opportunities, from a feeling of belonging. And then they start to not only fear rejection, but they are more commonly rejected. So if you look at the normal course of BPD symptoms throughout the developmental period starting from mid-childhood through early adulthood, you see that everybody increases in their um, burden of borderline personality disorder symptoms from the age of eight to 16. Now, I want you to think back to that time of your life. Um, for me, this was in like the 80s. And, you know, I, I, I love the kind of memes that remind us that we were our own human remote control. We would actually get up and go to the TV and turn the channel because there was no remote control. We needed to read in a book when the shows were on. Things that sound ridiculously primitive to us now in the mon modern age of 2024. But if you can think back to the time when you were eight to 16 and you will remember that you were trying to figure out how to be with your own more without your parents, 
or people looking after you and being kind of um, easy on you and providing more care for you than they expected um, things from you. And then as you enter adolescence, this starts to change that you are going through lots of transitions. You're confused about who you are, how high or low your voice will be, what your body will look like, whether or not the social um, environment is going to accept or reject you or expel you or be harsh or um, praising of you. It's a very uncertain time in a young person's life when they have a low level of skills and their brain is not fully cooked. So what more um, kind of unsteady time is there than that to develop BPD symptoms? That means that most kids will develop emotional liability, interpersonal hypersensitivity, impulsivity, or behavioral disinhibition and confusion about who they are in this developmental period normally. This actually levels off at about 14 and starts to decrease throughout the teen years and into early adulthood. And um, my dear friend, Carla Sharp, and a lot of people that have inspired her work um, really propose that this is because people are starting to develop a more stable sense of self. They tell a story about themselves, who they are, how they're going to be, how they act, what's important to them. And then they start organizing themselves around this sense of self and they become more consistent, predictable, more inhibited, um, less impulsive, more controlled, etc. And we develop these um, capacities throughout this period in adaptation to our environments. And then this kind of goes levels off over time as our brains mature and our as our lives settle down, so to speak. But some kids are born with a higher burden of symptoms. And of course, when you have more of these symptoms of emotion, dysregulation, behavioral and um, reactivity and interpersonal hypersensitivity, it's harder to stay in a social environment and not be rejected or expelled or withdraw from it because it's too challenging, um, simply because you have more symptoms. And these kids are identifiable. They're not just hiding out, minding their own business. They are sending distress signals either in fight or flight. And they have more difficulty telling a consistent story about themselves that's positive and that drives growth. They will usually tell negative stories about themselves or um, people will tell them they're bad because they are having more difficulty being in control. So not only are they suffering from higher burdens of symptoms, they're going off the development mental trajectory and getting isolated from their peers. And really then they have an added element of feeling like they don't belong, they're broken behind on repair, that there's something really wrong with them and nothing is ever gonna go right, nothing works for them, they should just give up. And of course, this is why people develop suicidal feelings. Other longitudinal studies that are prospective starting in childhood, like this one that my colleague Stephanie Stepp did, show that actually kids who have early BPD symptoms like impulsivity and a lot of negative emotions, they are more likely to have harsh punishment and low warmth from their parents. This is a transaction. And parents or carers are oftentimes challenged to channel the best version of their parenting skill in the face of a child that is difficult to soothe. I'm not saying it's the child's fault. I'm just saying that this is a bi-directional challenge. And the BPD symptoms drive a lot of this. So we need to support younger, young people earlier when we see these symptoms. And it's only in the teen years at age 15 that the um, harsh parenting and low warmth starts to predict BPD. So this is set into motion by endowment 
And these symptoms are er identifiable early and we can do more to help both the young person and their parents do a better job to decrease that likelihood of the transaction producing BPD later. This was also replicated in a study across the pond in the UK where dysregulated behavior early in childhood, ages four to eight, actually predicted social adversities such as bullying and maladaptive parenting that then become a risk factor for BPD symptoms, including self-harm at the age of 11 on the threshold of adolescence. So again, a place we can intervene earlier. You see, this is a process that's unraveling before the person gets their diagnosis. And oftentimes the uh, early signal is self-injury. So self-injury in adolescence is really important to attend to, even though it's not immediately dangerous because it's a predictor eventually of suicide attempts. And it is a sign of distress and a high mental anguish, which we should provide some um, support over. This starts early at the age of 13 years old on average and is pretty common. I say that more teens will um, cut themselves or injure themselves deliberately to manage stressful experiences um, more commonly than people will play soccer or play the violin. It's just a variation of adolescence that's pr pretty common. And a lot of this will naturally remit once that um, young person figures out a stable way of managing themselves, identifying themselves and relating to others. But in those who can't do that, it will become more severe and repetitive, okay? And this goes along with the unfolding of a lot of mental health problems, not just BPD, but BPD is the most common. Now, newer research shows us something that we need to pay attention to to better tailor treatments. Um, there are many pathways to self-harm, but they can be classified in two large groups. And this was from a prospective study from the community, meaning they just got a lot of people, 10,000 people in the community outside of London to be in this study. And they followed them from the age of five to about 14 when self-harm started to emerge. And they found that there were two pathways to for those who developed self-injury at 14. Both pathways had poor sleep, and low self-esteem. So there's already indicators of self-soothing, self-regulatory challenges, and also um, challenges to positive self-regard, okay? But there's one pathway that's called the psychopathology pathway where people have lots of indicators of adversity. We can really identify these kids early. They are bullied, they have poor emotion regulation, they have learning differences, their parents have challenges, they already meet diagnostic criteria for a number of disorders. They light up their signal that they need help really early on. And we need to provide them a lot of different kinds of help at that point. But then there's another group that the, the authors of this study label risky adolescents, which is actually a much bigger group. And they're a broader category of people who may actually be adapted to the developmental demands they face in a lot of different ways. In fact, these kids were better in math than kids who had no self-harm, but they are more risk-taking and they're less secure in relationships. And remember, they also have poor self-esteem and, self and sleep. So there are different profiles of people who will go on to have self-harm and they'll need different interventions. But what probably ties them in common is illustrated by this adult study that self-harm is a form of self -regu stress regulation. I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but I'm only showing this fact to tell the story that we know that in people who have BPD, incisions into the skin as a form of deliberate self-harm, not just pain, not just blood, that actually reduces aversive tension that people experience in the face of stress in those who have BPD, but not those who do not have BPD. 
And this is a biological indicator of something different going on for people with BPD. And it also reduces heart rate and physiologic markers of stress. So there's a powerful biological reaction that occurs in the face of stress that makes self-injury actually very effective in the moment, but it's um, problematic in the long run. The problem is even though self-injury is really common in use, there's very few um, interventions that are um, that have high certainty of evidence as being effective. So DBT adolescence is one thing that shows preliminary reductions in self-injury compared to it, other interventions that are more basic, but there's, there's not a lot of certainty to these conclusions. So we actually have to kind of think more broadly about how we intervene with these things. And based on the research about different pathways, we can do something that looks at common risk factors to inquire about self-harm um, very regularly in the context of larger life problems. When we talk to young people who are struggling and invite them to talk about their larger life problems, we can always ask them how they're coping with it. And it becomes a conversation that's an opportunity to help them manage stress more effectively in the environment that they're living in, um, trying to function in the world. You also have to address and treat overt psychopathology, things that become diagnosable in early life should receive appropriate treatments. But we're also trying to help people think about balancing demands and support. That is a life skill that when you are more um, stressed by demands, instead of just isolating yourself from others, you actually have to find ways of getting support. And treatment may be one, but there's many different ways. And using basic interventions um, is a good starting point for everyone. Just expressing concern, understanding risk factors, trying to help the person tell their own version of their life story and how self-harm fits within it so that they can be understood, first of all, and have some self-clarity about it and find different ways of solving their emotional problems. And what we can do by teaching younger people early when they start to have early signals of difficulty and, and um, the, the developing risk of having BPD um, in the near future, we can help them by learning how to balance stress and demands with support and capability. Learning capabilities over time is really the job of teenagers. So this is where recovery or functioning becomes an intervention in itself. Because what we see here is if you think about these icons on the left are stressful life demands. And then on the right are support and, and growing strength or capabilities. You wanna keep these things in balance. When the demands and stress are too much and the support and capabilities are too low, that's when young people or human beings in general face emotional crisis. Okay, this is understandable. It's not rocket science. So what you want to do over time is titrate them to be a little bit more balanced. So the support and capability meets the stress and demands. But the problem we have in our field is we oftentimes overcompensate and provide a lot of care and try to teach them lots of skills, but in the absence of a lot of demand. So we take them out of the context or the ball game of life. We overly kind of segregate them, put them into hospitals or treatment programs where they might assimilate and adapt, but then translating those gains into real world environments of demands and stress becomes more difficult sometimes when these are imbalanced. And then what happens is that the hospital becomes their world or treatment becomes their world and their kind of ability to develop a life in the context of the world outside of treatment becomes more 
shaky and unstable. And this also contributes to the functional difficulties that people who have a lot of treatment with um, the diagnosis of BPD face. And what we're trying to do is not be all or none, but try to balance these things titrated and tailored to each individual's situation. So what this means by balancing life responsibilities and demands and treatment or support means different things for different people in different contexts. Why does this matter? Because BPD will then, once it kind of develops in um, adolescence, start to affect life opportunities moving forward. So having BPD predicts academic functioning. So BPD features are known to be associated with lower grade point averages and more um, behavioral problems or disciplinary issues. And this short circuits the um, opportunities both developmentally and materially in life for people who have BPD. And they have a greater odds of having more limited education, which then unfolds into more limited life opportunities. And the good news is if they remit from BPD, they're more likely to improve their work and school performance and reopen those channels of opportunity um, as opposed to those who don't remit from BPD. And in particular, in this stage of life, self-harm and impulsivity, as well as affective instability, uniquely explain the variation in academic achievement and social maladjustment in um, school settings. That is across all students, not just those who have a diagnosis. So these symptoms of BPD become a liability for making use of life context to learn and grow and connect with people. So unsurprisingly, this also predicts occupational functioning. And I cannot stress enough how important work is for people who have personality disorders. And work means a lot of things broadly. We oftentimes think of paid work because we, we as human beings, need income to survive and pay for the things we need. Many times we can get on government support, but that is a very limited um, scope of life opportunity. Maybe for some people that's the best they can do, but it has its downsides. So BPD traits are associated with problems getting along at work, um, disciplinary actions, just like in school, more likelihood of losing one's job, which is not just the loss of income, it's a loss of a role, a predictable structure in life, and a predictable way of relating to others. And when you have the problems of personality disorders where you don't manage your relationship with others stably, this is a real loss. The rate of um, full-time employment over 10 years time for all personality disorders um, is higher than that of BPD. There's something as particularly disabling about BPD, even though a lot of people with BPD have lots of strengths and capabilities and lots of um, talents that they cannot channel into meaningful activity and then meaningful validation of their self-worth because of the way that the symptoms can get in the way of functioning. And then there's a vicious cycle that then having BPD is oftentimes met with um, encouragement to drop out of life to reduce symptoms. But this is really fairly problematic. And what happens is that people with BPD, even though that they, they may remit over time, they have a lower odds of working um, nine years after their diagnosis. That study was done in Scandinavia. But again, if you remit, you're more likely to have good and sustained work or school performance than not remitting. Now, this next fact really relates to Mary Zanarini's work that actually having poor occupational functioning is the biggest source of, a, of failure to recover. 
So the difficulty recovering has a lot to do with this instability of functioning in a workplace. And work itself, having a meaningful role that's predictable structuring and provides a sense of purpose and contribution, um, buffers against the worst health effects of BPD. There have been studies done that show that actually if you have BPD and you don't work, you're more likely to have become depressed, for example, and perhaps in some cases have more medical problems. Now this story goes on. I'm not gonna belabor this point because there's more facts than you need to know because the punchline is that if you have BPD or other PDs, you're gonna have problems in your romantic relationships and you're also going to have um, more limited social networks. Now, why does this matter? Our social networks become windows of opportunity for being exposed to new ideas, new opportunities, learning and growing. And what we know about people with BPD especially is that they have more conflicts in relationships, they feel less supported and less satisfied in these relationships. They um, tend to keep relationships with form former romantic partners more than people without BPD. And then they have a high risk of rupture or losing those relationships. And then they stay on the margins, even in adolescence, people with BPD as opposed to people without will date earlier, but ironically spend more time alone because they're more invested in exclusive relationships and not building a social network that they can rely on when any one person falters. And actually their social network determines opportunity and social mobility. But it feeds into itself too, because social exclusion, not having a feeling of belonging to a group actually makes it harder to regulate yourself. When you feel alone, it's hard to self-regulate. And actually self-regulation is ironically required to be included or not rejected. So there is this kind of bi-directional effect again that social inclusion requires self-regulation. And then once you feel a sense of belonging and containment in the world, it's easier to self-regulate. And the effects translate into the body itself because the stress of all this predicts physical health problems. There are BPD traits are associated with greater physical health problems that create disabilities and multiple problems and feelings of unwellness. People with um, BPD um, are more likely to have physical disabilities from disorders, use higher levels of medical services and feel unwell and be rated as unhealthy through by their medical um professionals. But if you remit, you're less likely to suffer from poorly understood medical conditions, which breed a bit of um, fear and insecurity vis-a-vis -vis those healthcare relationships. And um, you're more likely to make better lifestyle related choices and you're more likely to be able to keep your job um, related to being healthier or more medically stable. Now, I talked to you about this issue of stress reactivity versus stress generation, this idea that stressful life events make people have BPD symptoms versus people have BPD symptoms, so they develop stressful life events. And both may be true, but I'm going to tell you what the studies say about this. Now, stressful life events do cause most of us to have negative emotions, right? But actually, those negative emotions are not, not necessarily the cause of more bad events happening because we've made um, kind of reactive choices or done something self-defeating in the face of that negative emotion. So this study, which followed people over three years time with BPD showed that actually the, the fact that you get negative emotions in the face of stressful life events is not what makes people have more unfortunate 
problems, okay? It's actually instead the antagonism and disinhibition that comes with BPD. That's a BPD symptom that causes things like breakups, layoffs, closed opportunity, job loss, other stressors. They don't cause things like that we don't have control over, like natural disasters, obviously. But if we can help people with this antagonism and disinhibition that is a symptom of their illness, they are less likely to face ongoing stressors. I think that makes sense. And this is also true in the older set of adults, like 55 and beyond. This was a study that Chris Conway published that stressful life events don't actually cause more BPD symptoms in adults, but the BPD symptoms themselves are more predictive of having what are called dependent life stressors, meaning they have something to do with what the person with BPD does in reaction to stress as opposed to fateful stressors like natural disasters that people with BPD and people without BPD are just at equal risk for having. So this last part I'll go into um, before we wrap up is that BPD is a general factor of vulnerability. That is that it represents problems of self-management and self-direction and man, um, problems of being in a stable, mutually satisfying relationship with others because of the capacity for empathy and intimacy. Now, this actually feeds into um, functioning, obviously. So I told you before, BPD is one of the most impactful factors on functioning. And this is a study from Eclipse that Aidan Wright um, published in, in that purple line that just traced, that's a reduction in BPD symptoms over 10 years time. That tracks with um, functioning in employment, okay? So obviously when you have less BPD symptoms, you're going to have less problems of being employed. I think that we've gone over that, that makes intuitive sense, but actually changes in other personality features like um, dominance, detachment, dependency, these kinds of things actually don't change as much over time. It's the BPD part of it that's operative. And that's what also contributes to the comorbidity or co-occurrence with a lot of different psychiatric problems that make functional outcomes worse. And you see them here, the externalizing problems that represent the antagonism and disinhibition that Alan, Alan and his colleagues found in their study, that those features breed more life problems that keep people sick and keep people not functioning. And I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time and basically go to this slide that, you know, also the different personality disorders in, you know, features coexist and they also breed some dysfunction. But I think the bigger lesson that we have to hold on to is that people, um, all people, not just people with personality disorders, have to start with stabilizing their attachment system, their way of asking for the help they need when they're distressed and feeling like others are trustworthy enough to provide that help. That becomes a fundamental um, base of operations that help people have the best chances of regulating themselves. Once they regulate themselves, they have to develop a positive and realistic self-image that is a narcissistic domain of personality functioning. But they also have to use this secure foundation of relating to others and a realistic and positive sense of self to be able to control their interactions with reality. Okay? That's an obsessive compulsive realm of functioning. So these three um, angles of the triangle of personality functioning have to be 
supported and stabilized for pro people with personality disorders, whether they have BPD or a number of different labels, we can attach them. We need to teach people with personality disorders how these features work, not only to cause them distress, but also to impair their functioning. And that's what I think will really help people um, that we're not routinely doing yet right now. And that leads to the basis of um, personality functioning, which is in this slide, um, basically that we're trying to help people form a stable identity that's positive, that makes them hopeful, a sense of direction to help guide their decisions so that they can be less reactive and think of long-term goals in towards, instead of short-term solutions. And then if they can do that, then they may be able to more stably relate to others, understand their point of view, and trust them enough to get close to them, okay? So that's just the beginning of this conversation. I did wanna save time for questions.